some of you have not appreciated the, uh, the time you had from last Sunday because we ended with a valley of dead dry bones. And we were not very hopeful <laughs> the last time that we were there. But uh, today we will find the solution to that. Uh, let's begin by just looking again at the text in Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. And he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin and I will breathe in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I was prophesying there was a noise, a rattling sound and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone, and we are cut off. Therefore prophesy to them and say, O oh, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. The Valley of Dry Bones. Obviously, the message that God intended to portray through Ezekiel was that there was hope for Israel. Their situation and their circumstances had indeed put them in a place where they were dry, where they could see no hope. But God wanted them to receive a message of hope, even as they were being punished for their disobedience. Last week we looked at the first point, which was just this. It is possible to become stuck in a spiritually dry place. It is possible for spiritual people to become spiritually dry. And we looked at a number of things uh, that made that and contributed to that possibility. One is... That when the present seems less blessed than the past, we may feel like we are dried up. Our bones have gone dry. Another thing that can happen is that spiritual nourishment is no longer being sought, and so we can experience this dryness of spirituality. Or we may even allow ourselves to be buried in our own graves of disappointment. And as we bury ourselves, our bones become dry. We talked about a number of things that can disappoint us. We can be disappointed, first of all, with act, uh, the actions of other people. We can be disappointed with the actions of God. We can be disappointed with our own actions. And all of those disappointments can add up to digging deep graves in which we put our hopes, we bury our hopes. So that was the first lesson. The second lesson we look at today, it is possible for God to return one to spiritual life. It is possible for God to return one to spiritual life. There's a number of things that this text indicates are a part of that life-giving process. And we begin with this one. The whole text begins with Ezekiel saying that the hand of the Lord was upon him. I want to suggest that spiritual life is going to begin with the hand of the Lord. It's going to begin with that hand being present God has uh, repeated often in this text, at least twice, but throughout the book of Ezekiel, he's repeated it many times, the fact that people are going to know that I'm Lord. I'm going to do something so people know 
that my hand is involved in this. This is my work. And so here God says, if you want to have spiritual restoration, you need to understand the place where it comes from is from my hand. My hand. Interestingly, that phrase that the people will know that I am the Lord appears 50 times in the book of Ezekiel. 50 different times. God is wanting his negated people to know he is Lord. And guess what he wants us to know in times when our bones are dry? He is Lord. It's not about us. It's not about other people. It's about God being God. This morning in the teenage class, I asked them the question, why are you here? Why are you here? And they gave some good answers. They gave some right answers, which you would expect, you know, good kids give right answers. And I said, well, that's all well and good, but what do you do when you don't want to be here? What happens inside of you? How do you discipline yourself? And folks, one of the ways that happens is we recognize it's not about us, it's about the hand of the Lord. That's how we stay above this disappointment. Most often it appears in the context of judgment, whether against Israel's leaders, the nation as a whole, or its enemies. God wanted the people to know that he was Lord. Israel's disregard and disobedience of God had defamed his name in the world's population. The God of Israel had been brought low by the activity and the actions of Israel. So now he is wanting to produce actions that will bring a knowledge about him, not just to his people, but to the whole world. Chapter 38, he says this, I will make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. God wants to reestablish his hand. When we are in the valley of dry bones, the beginning place is for us to understand the hand of the Lord is ever present. It is always there. Also, I think we need to understand that the word of the Lord is a part of this revitalizing spiritual life. We looked at last time that the reason that bones dry up is because they, they miss the nourishment. So if we're going to rekindle those dry bones, nourishment must again be present. That word must come forth. Before bones can return to life, they must be nourished by God's word, tendons, flesh, and skin. That's why it's interesting that God gave instructions to Israel that he's supposed to prophesy to the bones. And what's he supposed to say? Hear the word of the Lord. It's what the Lord says. What the Lord says. Now, again, he's not talking about just hearing it, is he? He's talking about believing it. He's talking about processing it, taking it in. What are your bones, your dry bones, needing to hear from the Lord? What are your dry bones needing to hear from the Lord? Let me just, <laughs> I'm just I think I got three things I'm just going to throw up here. Trust in the Lord forever. Isaiah 26 and verse 4. Trust in, is that what your dry bones need to hear? Do your dry bones need to hear Paul write to the church at Ephesus and say, put on the full armor of God? Is that what your dry bones need to hear? Your dry bones need to hear, do not grow weary and lose heart. Your dry bones need to hear that? Folks, now... The reason I just chose these is because I just wanted to put not even a sentence, but a phrase up there that indicates how powerfully God's word replenishes our dryness of spirit. Just a little biblical phrase. Trust in the Lord forever. You meditate on that one today, I'll guarantee it'll begin to nurture your dry bones. Do you see why it's so important for us to hear the word of the Lord? It takes so little of it to accomplish great things in our dry spirits. So the life-giving process involved the hand of the Lord. It involved the word of the Lord. And then it says there was action. Ezekiel says, I began to hear a, a noise, a rattling noise, bone against bone. Those bones coming together. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bones, and I looked, and the tendons and the flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Dry bones willing to acknowledge the sovereign God 
and to hear his words, have heads and hearts ready for action. You see, when, when I am spiritually dry and I bring myself to a recognition that God's hand is always involved, there's never a situation void of the hand of God. And when I realize that God always has something for me to hear in my dryness, and I'm willing to listen, then what that breeds in me is the motivation to act. And so the dry bones begin to rattle. There may not be a lot of activity, but there's movement. There's, there's a rattling. And then they come together bone to bone. And then God begins to put onto that dry skeleton what it needs to live. The bones have action. God will assemble the lifeless pieces when the dried up pieces are willing to be assembled. God will put us back together when we are dry, as soon as we're ready to let him put us back together. If we resist, if we don't want it, guess what? He won't give it. And here's the remarkable thing. Israel's getting this while they're being punished. If our dryness is because of the discipline of God, guess what he's waiting to do? To put us back together. So the life-giving process, the hand of the Lord, the word of the Lord, action. And then there's the revitalized spiritual breathing and spiritual focus. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And breath entered them, and they came to life, and they stood up on their feet, a vast army. Prophesy to the breath, literally translated, means address yourself to the soul. <laughs> address yourself to the soul. Clark, in his commentary, says the four winds signify all parts in every direction. Literally, it is soul's come from four souls. Breath come from four breaths. Or wind come from four winds. The completeness, the completeness of breath. Dry bones will be able to inhale deeply when surrounded by God's hand, God's word. They will breathe in the completeness of God's revitalizing life from all corners. We're not talking about a momentary puff. This is not a little shallow respiration. This is the complete being inflated and resuscitated by the spirit of the God whose hand is upon me. I allow him to totally be my breath. And it's not without significance that both the Hebrew and the Greek term for wind or breath means spirit. You see, when we get our dry bones ready to present to God, he will let his spirit rekindle us. Let us be resuscitated. God's spirit is the spiritual ventilator. Thus, first of all, he gives life. You see, before this, there's no life. There's flesh, there's tendons, there's bones, all that's been reconstructed. But there's no life until the completeness of God's breath, of his spirit, comes into these individuals. You know what, folks? There's no life in us until God's spirit's in control of us. There's no spiritual life in us so long as we do a bunch of spiritual things, but self is in control. There's no real spiritual life in us. We're just a pack of dry bones. Romans chapter 8, the mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. This valley of disobedient dry bones. God says, I'll bring them back to life as soon as they want it, as soon as they make themselves ready to, to be beneath my hand and listen to my words, I will bring life back to them. But before they can have life, they have to have the willingness to receive and be controlled by my spirit. He also then leads. Not only does he give life, 
but he offers leadership. Again, Romans chapter 8. According to the sinful nature, if you live by that, you will die. But if by the Spirit you will put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit are God of God are sons of God. Who is going to lead us? Who's going to gain control of our attitudes and our actions? Who's going to control our heart now? You see, until we surrender those things to the filling of the Spirit of God, we remain dry. The Spirit gives life. Romans chapter 8, this is my adaptation, fitting it into this valley of dry bones. So don't try to find this in the book, it's not there. For if you live according to the dry bone nature, you will dry up and die. But if by the complete aeration of the Spirit, you will live. Because those who take in the very essence of the Spirit of God are living warriors in the resurrected army of God. God's Spirit will bring us back to that kind of life. He gives us life. He leads. No wonder that Scripture says, don't put out his burning desire to give life. Paul will say, don't put out the Spirit's fire. Have you ever considered that verse from the perspective that the Spirit has a burning desire to give this life, to come to dry bones and revitalize them? Quench or do not put out is a prolonged form of the verb that means to extinguish. It's not talking about neglecting it a little bit. It's talking about putting it all out together, to extinguish it completely. Don't do that to God's Spirit. Because if you do... You can't live. You can't have this life. Do not grieve the Spirit. Because we can grieve the Spirit by limiting His wind of influence. Ephesians says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve the Spirit. Well, how do I grieve the Spirit? Remember, what Ezekiel is prophesying to these dry bones is they need, they need to have the completeness of the Spirit from the four corners. How do I grieve the Spirit? Well, if I let bitterness have some space that he wants, he can't get there. If I let rage fill a part of my heart rather than it, he can't take that. If I allow anger and brawling and slander and malice to have places inside of me, the Spirit cannot completely fill me. So, I decide to be kind and compassionate, forgiving. Why? Because those are the fruit of the Spirit. And if I am living by the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit then is obviously where? <laughs> He's obviously in me. So you see how powerfully this all fits together. The Spirit gives life. The Spirit can be quenched. The Spirit desires to lead. We need to be careful not to put out the Spirit's desire to fill us up. A couple of weeks ago, Russ Willis was offering a prayer at our prayer breakfast, and his, uh, he, he, had, he used a phrase that just stuck with me and has just, you know, it's just been something in my head ever since then. He thanked God for being the God of the strong and the God of the weak. And that really is what we're looking at in Ezekiel chapter 37. God is the God of people in weakness, and he is the God of people in strength. Ezekiel's vision of dry bones indicates and illustrates God's ability to work within our weakness. The causes of our weakness may be that blessings appear to be diminished, that we lack spiritual nourishment, or that we become buried in disappointments. And we may be weakened by those things. Guess what? God is still our God when we're, in, when we're dry, <laughs> when we are weak. He is the God of the weak. And he has the ability to bring us to life, to make us a people who are renewed by God's hand, who submit to God's word and accept the nourishment that we find there, that we act upon the nourishment that we're, that we're receiving and that we surrender to 
the influence and the leading of the Spirit of God. And if we do that, guess what we are? We are strong. But the strength isn't in us. The strength is in what God is accomplishing. So God is the God of the weak, and he's the God of the strong. And if the strong forget God, then, as 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, they're going to stumble. They're going to fall. So you see, our God truly is the God of the weak and the God of the strong. So on the continuum of our spirituality, every Christian in this room is somewhere in there. We're somewhere between dried up, separated bones and living warrior. We're somewhere between there. So the question is, where are you today? Where are you? Are you dry? Are you ready to stop being dry? Are you a living warrior? And remember how it is you get that way and have maintained that. Regardless of where we are, there is still only one needful source for life. So if you're dry, you need to come to that source. If you're alive, you need to continue in him. That's the only way that we can have life. Valley of dry bones. What a powerful, powerful vision. What a great message, not just for Israel, but for us. This morning, as we contemplate where we are in our spirituality, we need to remember that Jesus always is just softly and tenderly calling us. Calling us to come home. He wants us to hear him. He wants us to know that his message, if we learn of him, that our burden can be light, that we can have life again. We don't need to be dry. Jesus calls every one of us this morning if you are subject to his call, if you are ready to hear, if you're ready to leave the valley of dry bones and to allow God to put life back into you, spiritual life, then will you come? Will you come as he softly and tenderly calls?